Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified. So what are we talk about? Well, I wanted to really talk a lot about Darvis this week. I know I've been touching upon him here and there over the past several weeks. But there's a lot of examples of the methodology in action, both good and bad. And one thing I was thinking about right before I went live here is like, well, I'm showing a lot of the same stuff. Well, it's the same exact stuff that I do. So I think it's important for me to show that. Also, if you go back in, if you can't sleep at night or yes, stealing a line from Greg Morris, don't operate heavy machinery afterwards, but go in and watch all my other shows and you'll see that everything I show you is something that I have already shown you and I'm building upon. Anyway, that'll make a lot more sense in just a minute. But some of this stuff is warts and all too. I'm not going to sh just show you the, the great stuff. Early in the stock chart shows, you probably thought, man, this guy's a genius because all these mystery charts worked out so well. Well, I knew over time we'd have a few stinkers here and there, and I'll show you a couple of those today. I know you can't wait to see a losing trade. Housekeeping. By the way, I do take requests. As I've been saying lately, I'm fairly backed up. So if you're trying to reach me, just give me a little time to get back to you. As far as answering the questions in this format, in this Trading Simplified show, because I'm backed up, what I've been doing lately is covering them in the weekend charts. I do Dave Landry's The Weekend Charts every Thursday, and lately I've been doing them at night. So check my website on Thursdays for the latest on that, and I'll be happy to cover your questions there. So feel free to send in some requests, and then we'll cover them likely in my Weekend Charts show. If you do need to reach me, DaveLandry.com slash contact if you want the slides from this show. And all the other shows that I've done here, along with all three of my books in PDF format, and also limited access to the members area. It does not include the Facebook group, unfortunately. But it also includes an introductory course and an introductory to market timing course. So lots of stuff to get to know me for free. All right, so I want to talk about the mystery charts, follow up on them, and follow up on the methodology in action by the way if i show you a trade either i am personally going to take that trade have took the trade or will take a trade like it or something very similar so a couple of ones in the pitch i did not take i took two out of the four and i'll show you those in just one second but if i show you something it's something that i personally will take or will possibly take okay so here's a mystery chart follow-up this is nh it was in a pretty decent trend in here, as you can see. If you look at the Landry light down below, this is what the ACP plugin, my ACP plugin, plug which is on sale now at stockcharts.com. If you click over here in the ACP window, the actual live window, you'll see a little plugin. And everybody who likes this video gets a free plugin. I'm like, Oprah, you get a plugin, you get a plugin. Anyway, NH pulls back a little bit, kisses that moving average. And down here, these are the days of Landry light. These are the days that the lows have been greater than the moving average. In this case, I'm using the 30 EMA. Lately, that seems to be a really good EMA to use. By the way, I know I say this quite often, but if this is your first show, I'm not a huge fan of using a lot of indicators. I see indicators as more of illustrators. They help to show you what's actually in the chart. 90% of the charts that I use, or maybe even 99% of the charts I use, are blank charts. But the pullback to the moving average, the Landry-like pullbacks, have been working out really nice lately with the market itself trending nicely and many sectors tr trending nicely. And that's why I've been showing it so much. But the plugin does have its uses, and I've been playing with it more and more and really have been enjoying it. I know, you want to party with me. <laughs> so you can see it pulls back to the moving average. This counts, again, the number of days. Notice it was up in the 40s, which means a really, really, really good trend. Comes back, kisses the moving average, goes back to zero. It dips below a little bit, but that's okay. It just, this stock has gone so far and so fast, it needed a bit of a correction. So we had an entry here, a stop down here, and an initial profit target up here. We're gonna exit half our shares at the initial profit target. So let's take a look what happened. It triggers an entry, and then unfortunately, pfft, comes down and stops us out. And yes, I did drop an F-bomb on that one. It happens. It's funny, <laughs> when I speak in person, sometimes I'll say, I'm going to show you something that I've never shown anyone. No guru has ever showed anyone. And then I show a losing trade. <laughs> 
But trust me, it happens. Spell with a silent SH. So this is what it looks like in the model portfolio. The model's based on 100K, 2% per position if stopped out. You don't buy, you don't put 2% of your portfolio in the stock. You buy 2% if stopped out. So that's a $1,000 loss times 2 is $2,000. Here's FUV. This is another former mystery chart. Nice, nice, nice uptrend. You recognize this pattern again. Look at that. Landry light pullback. Nice little pullback here to the 30 EMA. Entry here. Protective stop down here. And initial profit target up here. I did take this trade, and this was an official recommendation, by the way, in my trading service. I'll put a link up here, and you can go check that out if you want to take a look at the archives. And you can look at everything, as I often say, warts and all. And you can see it hasn't really done a whole lot. We're a little underwater on this one, but so far, so good. It seems to be hugging that 30-day EMI. Now, this was one that I recommended a week or so ago. And there are your parameters right there, 1410, 1070 stop, 1750 on the IPT, risk of 340. So you can see nice uptrend, and this is just an absolutely beautiful setup. I got so excited about this setup, and I, I told everyone I probably shouldn't say anything on, about how excited I am, and maybe got a little too full of myself. And so far, it has failed miserably, but we haven't stopped out. So the entry was here, stop is down here, and the IPT is up here. So it rallied up, hit that entry, but unfortunately came back in. But until we're stopped out, I'm not going to call this trade a loser, nor will I exit this trade. Now, I was on the pitch last week, and I want to follow up on the stocks that I mentioned and pitched, and I actually caught some of these, so I thought that was... Pretty cool to show you that I actually practice what I preach. SRNE, I set an entry above today's high. I went in and watched the YouTube video just to keep myself honest on all this. So the entry would be right there, and let's see what happened. And so far, it has imploded. In fact, I would take this one off of your watch list. So scratch that one off the pitch. No trigger, no trade, as I say ad nauseum. <laughs> Sometimes I'll recommend a stock, and six months later, somebody will say, oh, I'm down 50% in that turd you recommend. And I'm like, well, I don't think I would have recommended that stock. It's going straight down. And when I go back and do the forensics, I'll say, yes, I recommended it, but it never triggered. So very important concept. And I'm amazed at how many bad trades waiting for an entry will keep you out of. And here's the thing. If you avoid as many bad trades as possible, then you're going to catch more and more winning trades, and you're not behind the eight ball, so to speak. So here's another one I mentioned in the pitch. Trigger around 150 or so. Stop below the TKO low around 112. So there's the entry. There's a stop. And you can see it did rally up, kind of barely hit that entry, but unfortunately came right back in. And for those keeping score, if this was part of the hypothetical 100k accounts so it'd be a two thousand dollars risk 150 was the entry the stop below the tko low for a risk of 38 dollars so you actually would have only bought 52 shares but that's enough to give you a fairly ugly loss and what i try to do is is not get too upset on a losing trade i did not actually take that trade but i did take the nh trade what i try to do is try to make it a game after i drop my f-bombs i <laughs> I take it off my quote screen and stop watching it for one. And then in my best Paul Giamatti as John Adams voice, I say, I said good day, sir. I'm going to have to watch that. I quote that all the time, but I've never watched the movie. I like uh, Paul Giamatti. He's in Billions, by the way. Good actor. And he was in a movie called Sideways, which was pretty damn funny. Okay, so this is a IPO that I mentioned in the pitch and my rules for trading IPOs at least early on I have a pattern called buy at B which I'm going to flesh out in a little bit more detail and basically you're buying at a you're buying above the five-day closing high on a close provided that the high for the first five days of trading was not set on day one now if you want to see quite a few of these in action go back and watch last week's trading simplified show 
and then go to my YouTube channel, YouTube slash C as in Charlie slash Dave Landry, and look at the weekend charts for the past several weeks. I've, I've been really harping on this pattern because right now, IPOs are providing a phenomenal opportunity. So there's the actual trades that I took, 400 shares. In this case, because it had a fairly wide berth on the entry and initial profit target, and it triggered an entry not when it passed through that close but on the actual close itself so i bought right around the close when i saw it was going to close above that five day closing high the first five day closing high and then on the following day it rallied up and it was a little shy of what i wanted for a profit target i was hoping for 30 and change but i decided one day into a trade i should not look a gift horse in the mouth so i went ahead and sold half. And then, of course, in after hours trading, it did went up. It then went up a couple extra bucks, <laughs> unfortunately. So that was a bit of a bummer. But in trading, one thing I was thinking about right before I went live is that you have to make decisions and live with them. And that's a whole another presentation in and of itself. So this is the best trade of the week. And hopefully, so far. Now, I want to show you something here. The buy at B pattern, if you actually went through the IPO course, you'll see that I found that it works better in stocks that are less than $20 a share. Lately, I've been a little bit more lenient, but if a stock is above $20 a share, I then require a momentum filter. In this case, just a really simple momentum filter, such as Landry Light. In other words, the low, again, greater than the moving average. In this case, I just use a five-day simple moving average so it closed at a new high and the low is also above the moving average now i mentioned slv now i'm not a huge fan of trading etfs as i said in the presentation but they can alert you to possible opportunities within sectors the reason i don't like etfs is they tend to be more efficient and it's very hard for them to make an inefficient move though although occasionally like silver has done recently, it can make a very large move. The reason they don't move like I like is because in ETF, there's uh, usually a lot of players in the field or it's over a diverse area of stocks and it tends to, you don't get the inefficiencies that you would in trading some little hot biotech or something like that. Anyway, in the presentation, I talked about the fact that silver had begun to accelerate higher and it was a nice TKO. And I also said, if you did want to trade it outright, it would be a good way to gain some exposure to silver, the physical metal, while looking for possible inefficient silver stocks to trade. And in the presentation, I talked about the TKO, enter above the high, stop below the low. And as you can see, it really hasn't done a whole lot yet. But as long as that stop is not taken out, I'm not going to get too concerned. Now, I mentioned by the earlier, if a market is going to go from A to C, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. And as I often say, you can't just blindly buy at B. But with IPOs and a few caveats, you actually can. So here is RXT, which was also mentioned in the pitch. One, two, three, four, five. The reason I'm showing you these days, and again, go in and watch the last few weekend charts and then the last couple of Trading Simplified shows. But the reason I'm showing you these five days is I don't trade an IPO until they have been trading for at least one week. The earliest I will buy, let's say they come public on Monday, the earliest I will buy is Friday on the close. So the earliest I'll buy is on day five. In this case, the high was set on day one. As you can see, notice that subsequent days for the first week at least were less than a day one high. So my rule is that it has to close at a new high and it has to close above the day one high. And there it is right there. It triggers, so it was market on close. And as I've said before, these trades could be a little bit scary. And there's the actual trade in one account, 1,000 shares at 1828, round numbers. In this case, I was pretty lucky and I hit the initial profit target after the close. And I figured, hey, I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth and went ahead and took those partial profits and so far you can see it's pulled back in a little bit but at least i've got half my profits out and i'm a little lenient on the second loaf ideally i don't want to go negative on that because i want to make money in the trade overall 
But in this case, it just pulled back a little bit. might have gotten ahead of itself. So, so far, I've hung on with this, with this one. By the way, this was going to be a mystery chart because it took off and then pulled back. And IPOs, the first pullbacks, are a great place to trade. Another pattern similar to this is what I call the first deep retracement. And again, go in and watch. I don't, I don't want to last week at band camp you to death, but go in and watch last week of charts and i think also in trading simplified show in the trading simplified show i talked about apg and that was a first deep pullback so in this particular case we got a little pullback entries here stop is way down here and it triggers and so far it really hasn't done a whole lot from that secondary setup but as long as it doesn't stop out we're going to stick with it and see what happens good bad or indifferent and i'll follow up on that particular one in upcoming shows. Now, lately I've been on a Darvis kick. A while back I was talking with a client and he asked me about Docu, D-O-C-U. And I explained to him that sometimes stocks just go up and make these boxes, kind of like a Darvis box, one on top of the other. And there's not always a pattern of mine. Now I did notice there was a TKL and when I went back in and looked at the trading archives, I was able to find that day and it was on my watch list for that day. I just found that on that particular day, there was a lot more inefficient stocks that had the potential to move. So after some trial and error, he came up with a very, very simple system and he called them boxes. And the top of the box was a high that wasn't touched for three days. And the bottom of the box was a low that wasn't touched for three days. Now the dotted blue line in here shows you that third day. So you don't know the top of the box until the third day. So you have to be careful if you're drawing these not to use hindsight. So just a little quick background on Nicholas Darvis. He was a dancer in the 50s and he was offered a gig in Canada and in lieu of payment they were going to give him some railroad stock. So he wasn't able to make the gig. So he contacted the people and said, look, I'm no longer going to be able to make this gig, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll buy the stock from you anyway and give you the cash for it. On one little caveat, you cover my losses on the stock. And it's like, well, who would not take that trade, right? Well, they agreed, but only for up to six months. And you know what? I would buy any stock if somebody agreed to take my losses for up to six months. Dancing with the Trend stole that from my buddy Greg Morris. He was going to name his book that, but the publisher talked him out of it. Now, when I started working on this presentation a few days ago, I started writing what I wanted to talk about and a lot of quotes from Darvis and all, and there's just a plethora of good stuff, but there's also a few, a few criticisms, and I didn't want to, when I put this, these slides together, I realized with this limited amount of time, I wouldn't have enough time to really get into the good stuff. So I want to just get the criticisms out the way. And I don't want it to sound like I'm anti Darvis because there's a lot of things that can be learned from him. In fact, I'm on probably my sixth read of the book, or I've read it at least six times. And I, every time I read, it, I learn something new. And it's a book where if you read it and you don't know a whole lot about trading, it, it teaches you a whole lot about technical ana analysis, but every time I read it, I, I learn something new or it, it helps if you've been trading for a while and go back and reread it. And he's backed into a lot of different things. And I'm going to touch upon a few of those in one second. But the, the criticisms that I do have is that every methodology has its nuances. And I talk a lot about the nuances of my methodology, so I'm not immune. Believe me, if I was, you'd never see my fat arse again. But breakouts work in markets that are breaking out and following through. In 1999, breakouts work pretty darn good. In Darvish's time, they worked really well, at least for a while. But more often than not, especially in this day and age, you're going to fail with breakouts as a general statement. Now, even Darvis admitted that he expects to be wrong about 50% of the time. And this was in a really, really good bull market back in the mid-50s, mid to late 50s. The thing is, now that everybody has a computer on their desk, everybody sees the breakout, so everybody's trading them and everybody else is fading them. 
So his failure rate in today's market would likely be, and there's no way of knowing exactly, but I'd say probably 80 to 90 percent, given his super tight stops. His stop went in right below the bottom of the breakout, and more often than not, I can all but guarantee he would have gotten stopped out. Now, again, he was in the right place at the right time. Now, he was in the right place at the right time. If you go back to the 50s, he made some money in 57. And then one interesting lesson I, I kind of want to get into in upcoming shows is that he was stopped out before this bear market, if you want to call it that, actually began to sell off in earnest. And then the crux of his money was made in 58 on in that massive run higher, as you can see here in the S&P 500. So he was in the right place at the right time. But I know a lot of people who have been in the right place at the right time, make a lot of money and then blow up. And I know a lot of people in the right place at the right time that fail to make a lot of money. And the example I often give is I know someone who made $80 million and kept it. And he told me point blank. He said he was in the right place at the right time. He was like in the land of the blind and he had one eye. Well, because the market he was trading was a zero sum game, that 80 million came from a lot of other traders. So not everybody made money during those great times. He did have a system which was fairly well defined, but in the book, every now and then, he did things that were a bit arbitrary. In one case, and I'll get you some fairly exact figures on this, but he exited some perfectly good stocks to raise capital to buy another, where he could have just continued to trail his stop higher and would have made, in some cases, maybe another 100% on his money by sticking with the winner. Another example of some of the arbitrary things or inconsistencies is that he had a rule that if he was stopped out twice. Basically, he was saying that the personality of the stock just was not for him. And that's something I, I can flesh out in a little bit more detail in the upcoming shows. But he said if he got stopped out twice, maybe the stock's not from him. And then he decided to move on. But then a page and a half later, he talked about a big winner that he got into after losing money twice in a row on it. So I'm not sure how to reconcile that. By the way, he did write a second book, which I'll talk a little bit about in upcoming weeks, called Wall Street, The Other Las Vegas. It's not a fantastic book. It's kind of a, some ramblings here and there. But what I did like about the book is it gave you some insight into the How I Made Two Million book. And I think it's, it's definitely worth reading just for that. And by the way, these books are $4.95 each. If you, you, know, you should be able to afford a 495 book. Now, he did have a money management plan in the sense that he had a really tight stop going in, which, okay, that's fine. And again, in today's markets, he would probably get stopped out 80 to 90% of the time. So that's good that he had a tight stop. Although, I think in order to make it work in today's market, you would have to have a really, really loose stop and trade a lot fewer shares. But he would often put two times his account in one stock. He would leverage his account up to two times his account value through margin. And sometimes all of his money was in one stock. And it could have easily been how I lost $2 million after making $2 million in the stock market. Now, in a lot of cases, I think if he knew a little bit more about money management, not to take anything away from him because he did really well for himself, but in a lot of cases, he could have possibly taken partial profits along the way. He was really stressed out when one of the stocks skyrocketed higher and was halted and he wasn't he wasn't sure what to do. He wasn't sure whether he should trade it in the OTC market and just get out at a really good profit or hold on. And so he went out drinking <laughs> to think about it. Well, one thing that he didn't know is that you could always sell down to the sleeping level. He could have sold half of the stock, put a hundred grand profit in his in his pocket plus take off all that risk and still have half of it on. So he could have sold down to the sleeping level. Now, when I started putting in this presentation, I realized that I'm criticizing him a lot, but there's a lot more that's really worthwhile. So I think there's a few caveats in there, like he could have easily blown up. Breakouts don't always work. He was in the right place, right time again. 
but he did discover a lot of little things mostly by backing into them he learned how to create a technical analysis type of system one of the inconsistencies by the way is that he talked about he didn't use fundamentals and he learned that hey all i need to do is get a get in a stock and have it go up it doesn't matter what the stock does it doesn't matter about the fundamentals he later added them back but it was not perfectly clear on how he added them back and then Again, another inconsistency on some of these stocks, even after he added back in fundamentals, he continued to trade without fundamentals. So, and that's something that I'll pick apart as time passes here. But he, he backed into a lot of stuff in addition to technical analysis, was a lot of things such as trading psychology, behavioral science, and a lot of things dealing with emotions. Now, again, breakouts work in markets that break out and tend to follow through. And my favorite market for that is IPOs. Now, again, I'm a pullback player, but I will trade breakout patterns in IPOs. So if we go back to that RXT, on the first day of trading, it makes a high, and that high is untouched for one, two, three days. So according to Darvis, that defines the top of his box. And if we take a look at what happened on subsequent days, you can see that it kind of meandered within that box and then it broke out of the box. Now, my pattern here, I would actually buy on a close, he would buy on a breakout. Now keep in mind, if you go in and look at the intraday charts, maybe not on this one, but on many of the IPOs I've been studying lately based on his methodology, you would have instantly gotten stopped out. Now where he would have gotten back in and whether he would have gotten back in more than two times after getting stopped out twice, I guess that's up to speculation. But anyway, you could see that it would have gotten you in here. One thing, just to show you real quick, notice that it did dip back below the box, so he would have gotten stopped out. If he didn't get stopped out on a day one, it would have gotten stopped out there. But the point is not to prove that it doesn't work, but to show you that it's possible that the box is could have some uses in a market that tends to break out and follow through like IPOs. And now, as I said a few weeks ago in the week in charts, one thing I like to do, I've always done this before I even knew it was the Darvis box, is I would put a trend line on a high or a low just to see if the market is developing a trading range. And if we look at yesterday's trading range, you can see that it started off with a Darvis box. And then if you could extend it forward, we kind of chopped back and forth all day. And I did try to play that opening gap reversal yesterday. I shorted a couple times in the S&P futures and got stopped out. But then by the end of the day, that breakout based on some other patterns, not just Darvis, I was able to capture a nice little move overnight and was out this morning and late last night. So it can help to keep you out of choppy markets. Now, what I really want to get into with the Darvis is the psychology, the emotions, and the behavioral science. And it's kind of interesting. You read all these books on all these subjects, and then you go back and you read something simple like Darvis, and he accidentally sort of backed into all these different things. And I've, like I said, I've got about four or five pages of handwritten notes that I want to discuss just on the things that he sort of backed into when it comes to trading psychology and behavioral science. Well, that's my time for this week. If you need to reach me, davelander.com slash contact. If you want a plethora of information to keep you busy for a long time, davelander.com slash stock charts. I want to thank everybody for watching and may the trend be with you. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.